tonight, our topic is Law and Order, the History and Politics of New York Criminal Justice with the Marshall Project. And I have many, many thank yous. Um, I want to thank our wonderful partners at the Marshall Project, especially Andrew Epstein, for being really absolutely wonderful to work with all of these months as we put this program together. Uh, and I want to say that I hope this is the first of many collaborations with them. Um, the Marshall Project, as you may know, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization that creates a sense of national urgency about the U.S. criminal justice system. It seeks to impact through journalism and to render the criminal justice system more fair, effective, transparent, and humane. Founded in 2014, the Marshall Project is the youngest news organization ever to win a Pulitzer Prize. I'm not going to talk anymore about what, um, what this evening's about because you'll hear it now. <laughs> what I'm going to do is um, introduce our moderator for this evening. Um, and she, in turn, will introduce the panelists. Carol Bogert is the president of the Marshall Project. Carol was previously deputy executive director at Human Rights Watch, running its award-winning global media operations. Before joining Human Rights Watch in 1998, Carol spent 12 years as a foreign cor correspondent for Newsweek in China, Southeast Asia, and the Soviet Union. Please help me welcome Carol and our panelists to the stage. Thanks so much for coming tonight. I guess that you just heard in that introduction a little bit about what is the Marshall Project. Nonprofit media, we write about criminal justice, a single focus on this topic. We just cover the heck out of it every single day. Um, I know that there's some people in the audience who are members of the Marshall Project who became aware of the event because we blasted it out to our members. So those of you who are members, thank you so much. And I've seen at least one Marshall Project tote bag here. That's good. And uh, for the rest of you, we are, we would love to have you join as members. My colleague, Andrew Epstein, who's sitting right there in the white shirt, can take your name. But first, maybe you want to learn a little bit more and see us a little bit in action, and that's what we're doing here tonight. It's wonderful to be in this gorgeous venue, and I'm always impressed at how many of you are willing to come out on a beautiful summer evening to talk about things that are hard. This, this is not happy news, and the criminal justice system is, is not a happy place, even under the best circumstances. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking tonight about uh, some of the worst of the criminal justice system which this city has lived through. And explore a little bit about how, why, and how New York City changed. It has changed. And it could change again. So let's look a little bit at what drives change. To help us do that, we have three incredible panelists. Um, farthest away, I'll start with you, Tom Robbins. He's a contributing writer at the Marshall Project, also an investigative journalist in residence at the City University of New York uh, School, Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, the series that he wrote on violence in New York prisons um, with focus on Attica, which was produced with the Marshall Project and the New York Times, uh, was a 2016 Pulitzer Prize finalist for investigative reporting, and it won the 2016 Hillman Prize for newspaper journalism. So Tom has been a columnist and a staff writer at The Village Voice, The Daily News, The New York Observer, pretty much everywhere, right, Tom? His footprints are all over the city, and he lives in Brooklyn. Oh, no. I was about to say, Graham, you were born and raised in Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, in 1974, he joined the New York City Transit Police, and he spent much of the next 20 years as a plainclothes detective in the major case unit. So he's a certified investigator with the NYPD, the state of New York, and the FBI. In 1995, Graham co-founded the organization 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care a really unique and important perspective that we look forward to hearing more about. Um, Kim Phillips-Fine, 
Directly to my left is the Associate Professor of History at New York University. Uh, she teaches courses in American political, business, and labor history. Her first book called Invisible Hands, The Making of the Conservative Movement from the New Deal to Reagan, tells the story of how a small group of American businessmen succeeded in building a political movement to challenge the New Deal order. Her 2017 book, Fear City, New York's Fiscal Crisis and the Rise of Austerity Politics, was a finalist for the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in History. A lot of Pulitzer karma here, right? <laughs> yes. And I was also born in Brooklyn. So. Also born in Brooklyn. Okay, I am the only person on the panel. I don't live in Brooklyn, I live in Harlem, and I was born in Chicago, but I feel the Brooklyn spirit. <laughs> I want to start with the idea of fear city. Uh, not least because that's the wonderful and provocative title of King's book, but because that describes this city in a time um, that for some of you is either a distant memory or maybe you weren't alive. So let's talk a little bit about what that looked like and felt like and where that came from. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to kind of reflect on your memories of 1970s New York. What a different place that was from the New York of today. We have a few visuals to help the audience kind of visually connect to what the city felt like at that time, what the rhetoric was, what the spirit was. Ken, do you want to start that off? I guess so. I, I, I mean, I, and I, I don't have um, I have so many personal memories of the, the time, of course, but I, um, I think the, 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 as, this is a pamphlet that was produced by a coalition of police unions in the midst of the fiscal crisis in the summer of 1975, when it looked like the city might go bankrupt and several thousand police officers were laid off um, and or, or threatened with layoff. And the pamphlet was produced with the intention of being handed out at the city's airports, especially Kennedy. And it was actually part of a larger campaign. The police would drive around the city with these sound trucks, blaring messages about um, a kind of about about fear in the city. And if you open up the pamphlet, it says the survival guide for visitors to the city of New York. It contains a set of warnings, punitive warnings to tourists, saying don't don't go on the subway after 6 p.m. Stay off the streets. Whatever you do, don't go to the South Bronx. Likening the South Bronx to Fort Apache. The set of very, you know, the, the image of the kind of the urban jungle and of a very racialized set of ideas about crime and violence in New York. Now, the, the pamphlet actually was never distributed at the airports as was intended. There were any people went out there, but the mayor Beam um, got an injunction against its distribution, and it the, the, the unions appealed and overturned the injunction on First Amendment grounds. But in fact, there had been so much outcry at that point that it no longer seemed as worthwhile to actually distribute the pamphlet. But I think it speaks to the atmosphere of kind of both action, fear of crime. I mean, as, as we'll discuss, the number of homicides in 1974 is about 1,500. There are much higher levels of all kinds of crime. But the, in some ways, the homicide systems are the most striking because they're the, the ones which are kind of least um, dependent on reporting or different kinds of reporting. And, and, and there's, there are much higher levels of violent crime, but at the same time, there are also a kind of a set of images and a politics about crime and people trying to use crime to press different political agendas and to talk in different ways about the problems in New York at the moment. Um, and as the police unions were doing in kind of talking about in, in having this, this image of fear and pressing a, a kind of, um, you know, a, a sense of the, the, the violence and danger of the city. Yeah, so, it's nice to know that mayors and police unions have a long history of getting along really well together, right? I just want to clarify one thing you said, Kim. You right. talked about the murder rate being reported. I, is it that you mean that when someone, when there's a corpse, everyone knows it, whereas if there's a burglary... Well, it was actually a, a moment, I don't know if you, either of you know more about it, but in the, in the, in the mid-1960s, there was a point at which crime rates in New York appeared to skyrocket, um, but in part what happened was there was a, there had been a shift <coughs> in the way in which crimes were reported and analyzed. This is during the Lindsay year, so it's a little bit earlier than this. But it, it just is a suggestion, you know, it, 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 that, you know, in a way, 
homicide is the least, um, yeah, there's, there's a body and it's mm -hmm. harder to uh, kind of all, it's harder, it's just not dependent on statistical reporting, right. um, you know, strategies, right. techniques, let's let, and so. Right. Graham, maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience of Fear City from a very different perspective. We were on the police force at that time. Oh, yes. I joined the department in 1974, and I got laid off in 1975. So, <laughs> uh, Abraham B. might remember quite well, and, uh, <laughs> for more reasons than one, but I also did some work with Deputy Mayor Mario Zaccotti during those years when I was laid off. And uh, Sanford Garland was the chief of the transit police, and he was looking to run for mayor. The politics is all the thing. Um, so we made sure that Garland did not get the green light to run for mayor because he was pledging the crime stats in the suburbs in the transit system. And as the president of the laid off police officers, the guys that were still on the job were funneling information to me every day. And I was working as a total clerk. And they knew every day where I would be, and they forwarded information, and I got it out to Gabe Pressman and different people. So Garrett never got to be the mayor of the city of New York. Uh, now, we nothing has changed but the data on the calendar. Uh, we see with the national situation, and there's 13, you know, the Mexicans, we need a border wall. Fear is a constant myth. It's not a myth. It, Fear is a spirit, but it is, per is perpetuated by politicians and, at times, by labor unions. Um, that time was a very violent time. When I became a police officer, my mother said, are you crazy? Uh, I was in full-time ministry before I went into the police department. So um, police officers were dying at a rate of one a month, and sometimes two back-to-back -back days. I used to carry the caskets. My partner was shot in the face uh, back in 78. But the politics is always there. Um, I remember when Dexter Robinson was shot years later. And, and let me go back. The crime levels of the mid-70s were extremely high. But you cannot look at anything in isolation. History is not that way. Um, the heroin trade cocaine trade are tied into the civil rights movement. I'm going to explain it to you. Malcolm and Martin were the two most powerful black men in the United States outside of government, and Adam Clayton Powell was in government. The power that these two men held had to be brought to a stop. You had J. Edgar Hoover. But because of the movements that black people were involved in at that time, heroin was brought in to quell and dummy down the people. That's a fact. It's not a theory. I don't deal in theories. History was my major, and life is reality. Heroin was brought in into the black communities. It was brought in by the CIA and other groups and dispersed throughout the black community. Now, with that, you've got to look at education, you've got to look at de facto and segregated housing. New York City has the most segregated school system in the United States right now. You cannot attack any of these issues with looking at the totality of this society because everything is interrelational. Guns were proliferated throughout New York City. We don't manufacture guns in New York. They're shipped here with intent purposes. They were shipped into the south side of California, south central. Railway cars were left unlocked with munitions in them intentionally. Because when, you're, when your merchandise is stolen, you report it to the insurance company and you get a check, right? That's quicker than putting them on the shelf in the store. So that's what they were doing. Um, the, the crime, I, I lived in Clinton Hill at that time, and there were days I couldn't even get to work because I was making an arrest on the way to work, <laughs> walking down Clinton Avenue. Women had their jewelry snatched, their pocketbooks snatched. Um, 
Women were being shot for their coats. I had a young lady who was shot for her sheep shearling coat. She refused to give it to the guy he shot her. He said, you can keep it now, it has a hole in it. Um, crime was real, and your life was cheap in those days. And it wasn't just relegated to black and Latino communities. I worked in Fort Apache. First day of patrol as a rookie, I was in Fort Apache. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But when you push fear, you can get people to do two things. Acquiesce all rights and privileges under the illusion that somebody is going to protect them or cause certain groups of people to flee in totality. And by doing that, you further bring in a greater demise within the city itself. Mm -hmm. And politicians will talk about law and order and order. That is not a reality. Mm -hmm. There are no law and order candidates. Thank you, Graham. Tom, maybe you could speak a little bit of this from the perspective of a journalist. You were covering the city at that time. What do you remember not only about the state of the city, but the state of the media? I mean, I, you know, one of, the, one of the observations I'd make is that as much as you know, we're sort of labeling the 70s as the era of Kansas City, uh, it did really carry over for, for more than a decade, or more than a decade and a half, or, uh, in terms of, of the crime rate and, and, the, and the, the amount of mileage, as Graham correctly points out, that politicians got from using that as their sort of political fulcrum to be able to either win office or to be able to persuade people that we needed a really fierce police department. So, you know, I, I, there certainly was, I mean, that's a pretty great story about having to make a bus before you get on the, on the bus, you know, to, to go to work. Right? And, uh, and clearly the, the crime rate was, was, was much higher at that point, but so it was also through the through the 80s and, and into the 90s. And, and you know, I see a lot of people whose hair is almost as gray as mine in the audience. So we all remember that, like, it's a slow motion thing to both live through and to report on. And you know, in terms of, of my business, you know, of, of journalism and, and reporting, I, I worked for both the quote alternative press. Uh, at the Village Voice in, in, in other places, uh, as well as at the New York Daily News, which was at that point about as mainstream as you could get. And, and I can almost measure like the way in which some of our front pages and our stories would, I'm not sure if it was conscious, we would raise the temperature in the city by the ways in which we would uh, report terrible crimes. So, I mean, even as crime began to fall, I mean, you know, one of the great anomalies is that today everybody credits the administration of Rudolph Giuliani with bringing down crime dramatically, and it did fall. But what they don't ever gets recorded because it's lost to history, and Graham will remember that because he was working in City Hall for part of that time, is that the number of homicides began to fall in the last years of David Dinkins' administration. And it happened after, you know, a terrible crime. I mean, you know, you want to, like, shine a spotlight and get more cops. All you do is, is kill a white tourist in the middle of Times Square. And, and the murder of Brian Watkins on the subway platform, a uh, kid who was in town with his family to visit uh, the Forest Hills tennis matches, you know, created the political momentum, and it wasn't us at the Daily News, but the New York Post ran the front page, do something Dave. And that led to oh, adding to cre increasing the number of cops on the street. We were up to a high of 40,000 at that point. So, I mean, I just, to live here at the time was to incorporate that fear into your everyday life. You know, it was not the image of everybody cowering in their apartments and afraid to go out. It was, we did the best with what we had. If we needed to have bars on our windows, we had bars on our windows. You know, if we needed to be careful not to walk on one side of the street, we didn't walk on the side of the street. But the, the way in which both, I think, the political powers that be and the media, to, 
to our shame, you know, portrayed it when it was convenient was, was very different. Uh, and, you know, if we want to, when we get to fast forward, how did that happen? You know, I think that's another story we can get into. I appreciate what you said about the slow motion nature of how a city changes and how fear comes to grip a city. Um, but there are also, of course, events that kind of can propel that in one night. Let's talk a little bit about the blackout in 1977. You know, 1,600 stores robbed, uh, a lot of looting and burning and torching. Uh, 3,700 people arrested the following day, many of them housed in awful conditions since there were not jails prepared to, uh, to hold them. Um, and as you have written, this is kind of the beginning of the road to, to a lot of things. Maybe you want to elaborate on that, Kim. Yeah. Right. Well, I think the block, the blackout, and the subsequent <coughs> property destruction, um, you know, I think still kind of galvanized. I mean, they they, they were uh, tremendously galvanizing, or just of, of attention and fascination. I mean, I, I'm curious to your recollections, but in the kind of press about it at the time, and then subsequently, there's enormous historical interest in this event. And I think it partly has to do almost with the, you know, the, the, um, the suddenness of it, or the kind of, the, 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 you know, there's kind of property destruction in all five boroughs. It just happens very quickly. Um, and, and then afterwards, there is an incredibly intense, fierce, and I think even beating at this point, kind of shocking response and reaction to it or kind of a condemnation of the people involved as animals, as worse than animals, as insect life, um, people writing into the New York Times and other newspapers saying all looters should be shot on sight, people should be shipped back to Puerto Rico, where they came from, or the South. The, the, this, this kind of, in this, this very uh, kind of, sense of this as an event that signals a kind of broader out of control um, politics in the city or in, and, and I think in, in a sense it's actually you know e the, I think that there were a lot of sociologists who wrote about the blackout and subsequent um, wave of theft and it's clear that there, there's a kind of it became an incredibly widespread phenomenon. I mean, there were kind of a first group of people who broke into stores, but then a much larger swath of people in neighborhoods just kind of going in and taking stuff in a much more, it, it is it, in a much more kind of casual way. And actually one of the photos in Fear City, which I reprinted most of the, the media images of this, are of young black and brown men taking stuff and kind of running down the street. There's an enormous number of photos like this, but I was, I would have, after looking around, I did find this photo of kind of a uh, very genteel, elderly white couple taking up some things out of an A&P store that had been broken into, and the, the man is kind of gently helping the woman down out of the window, uh, out of this like broken window. And so I, I just think there's, the, the phenomenon of the looting is a complicated and kind of in, in, interesting one. What happened and how to understand it? But the response was this very, angry and, um, and and kind of violent in its own way response. And I think helped to legitimate a sense that, what, that, that locking people up was the only alternative because people and the people who would do this had so completely violated the social contract. And actually there are some conservative writers who write about it in these terms and say anything else is actually patronizing and uh, kind of not treating the people involved as full, full moral individuals, or to recognize them as full moral individuals, the only answer is um, prison and punishment. And I think that the whole event, it's not, 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 you know, not all by itself, but it becomes part of a logic of policing in New York City, and, you know, and, and I think nationally too, because it, you know, this is an event that galvanized attention around the country, not just in New York. The language that you mentioned around insects, I found particularly chilling because of the years I spent in Human Rights Watch. And if you know anything about the Rwandan genocide, you may know that the Hutus described Tutsis as insects. And that was part of the dehumanization process that made genocide possible. 
there's really almost nothing more dangerous that one human being can do to another than to imply that they are not human. It sets them up for a kind of violence. And that is, of course, precisely what happened in the wake of uh, that looting and that dehumanizing of populations. Do, do you have specific memories of that time, Graham? Or? Yeah, I was working that night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was in this time. As a matter of fact, we moved from, we were moving across Brooklyn from downtown Brooklyn, 4th Avenue. I wound up down on Marcy and Myrtle. And uh, we had shootings going on, you know, people shooting at us. We just returned fire. We didn't even record anything. You know, people shooting out of the windows, just fire back. Nobody returned fire, let's go. And we, we went on to the next area. And I wound up arresting a young fellow for burglary. And uh, he wanted to be an attorney. And he's playing cat and mouse with me for like five hours. And I finally arrested him with a piece of medical machinery. He couldn't even sell. He didn't know what it was. But, you know, we, we see the pictures of the looting. We don't see pictures of the looting by businesses uh, taking advantage of the poor. You don't see the looting of people's lives by landlords who are so sleazy um, where they are renting out apartments that you wouldn't put a dog or a cat in. The looting of people's lives is never addressed. See, property is more important to this country than people. The greatest resource of any country is not in its resources mineral-wise, it's in their people. And when you denigrate a people, when you force people to live under certain conditions, there is a time when they will erupt and come back on you. Um, you are seeing that with regard to the situation in the Middle East. What we were doing to Persia, this may sound like it's off track, but I keep saying nothing, is by, nothing happens by itself. Go back and look at history and what we did in Persia with the Anglo-Persian Oil Company in 1952. And the British were ripping off the Persians for their oil. The Persians put them out. The British came here, collaborated with the CIA to go back and topple the Persian government, run the Prime Minister out, and we put the Ayatollah in and renamed the country Iran. You don't know the history. And then you turn around and we gave Saddam Hussein certain materials to use, sarin gas that we sold to him, but we were trying to overthrow him with the CIA, training the Kurds to move against Saddam. And when Saddam realized it, we pulled our people out and left the Kurds there to die. You see, we are in the process of looting people all around the world. Your hands are not clean. We are the largest terrorist unit in the world. And you need to know it. Because you're going to have to own it. And this is why we're in the situation we're in now. Malcolm said it, chickens will come home to roost. It is a biblical fact. We cannot abuse people, violate people's rights, and think that they're going to sit back and take it on the chin. No, some may think I'm promoting violence. I'm not promoting violence. Um, my family knows violence. My father and grandfather had to shoot it out with the Ku Klux Klan in Georgia in the 1930s. Had they not done that, I wouldn't be here today. So I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with people defending themselves. I have a problem with abuse. I have a problem with governments that abuse their citizenry and people of other countries just because they don't look like them, they don't worship like them, they don't speak like them, they don't dress like them. And we have to check this. <laughs> capitalism, you did a book on capitalism. <laughs> Greed is a very avarice quality. There's nothing wrong with being in business, but
but to exploit people and to take advantage of people. When the sanitation department comes to pick up the garbage, they spill stuff, they don't get the broom and sweep it up, they leave it right there and they go on about their business. Schools, I was at a school, I used to run a uh, Head Start Center a few years ago. We had 140 children. The public school across the street is holding a bake sale to buy books for the school. That is insane. How the devil does the school not have books? But in Bedford-Stuyvesant, the children don't have books. So, and then they have the temerity to put pictures up of black people looting a store when the very people who stand up and salute the flag are responsible for the conditions of people across the country. You cannot, I cannot isolate myself from anybody under any given situation. And I'm going to stop with this. I warned a group of law students at Quinnipiac Law School a number of years ago. As an attorney, you better do right by your clients, boys, because it will come back on you. And don't think because you live in the suburbs that the insanity can't reach you. Insanity has reached the suburbs. It's reached the schools. Children are dying everywhere. And there is a moral tenor that we have lost in this country. We've lost it. And if we don't go back, those of us with gray hair, we have a point of reference. You remember in public school, you went to uh, religious instruction in the public school. The Jewish kid went to shul and the Catholics went, you know, you, you had everything. But there was a respect for human life. The, we, we are in a lobster pot, ladies and gentlemen. And you don't realize it. I, when I was studying military science at City College, Earl D. Woods, the Lieutenant Colonel said, we fashion the thinking of the people. That was 1968. And Earl D. Woods was in Laos and Cambodia when John Kennedy was telling you we didn't have troops in Laos and Cambodia. We, we cause you to think the way that you think. And in that lobster pot, when you finally wake up, it's too late. I'm going to stop there. You know, one thing I just, to like, put it in a little bit of other perspective in the politics of it. I mean, it's, and Kim's book tells this pretty clearly, and, and Graham will remember, is that the blackout took place in an election year here in New York City. We were, we were electing a new mayor. You know, the mayor, A. B., who, who laid you off, was running for re-election, and given what had happened to the city, both financially and on almost every other level, there was just a free-for-all for, -all for trying to replace him, and, and one of the things that was remarkable was that the Democratic primary that year was probably the greatest collection of really great liberal political talent that was all seeking to become mayor. Bella Adson was running for mayor, you know, as, as great a woman as ever, you know, had a role in politics in this city. Percy Sutton, who dressed almost as good as Graham, was <laughs> incredibly Elegant, you know, wonderful guy. Uh, Mario Cuomo, uh, Herman Badil, you know, who was, you know, before he went, I think, off the deep end in the Giuliani years, but I think one of the most brilliant people who ever worked for the city. And then there was this guy, Ed Koch. And how am I doing? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he, he would, he would, when he started that race, he was so considered out of his depth. You know, nobody thought that Ed Koch could win that race. And it was the blackout that really put the wind in his sails, and he did it with one very easy battle cry. And, you know, people here probably heard him go into the streets in the city. I'm for the death penalty, who's with me? You know, it was one thing that he said wherever he went, is he had this death chant, I'm for the death penalty. And and because of the impact of the riots and because of the fact that, look, neighborhoods got destroyed. I mean, I do remember driving down Flatbush Avenue the morning after 
and looking at the stores that have been <coughs> devastated, the gates that are pulled into the street, and, and just realizing this is not good for anybody. This is really bad, and it, and it was. All of that <coughs> accrued to Ed Koch's enormous advantage. He didn't win clear out in the primary. He ended up in a uh, runoff with Mario Cuomo, as you'll remember. And, you know, it was one of those, like you talk about a turning point for New York. There's lots of problems with Mario Cuomo, who, of course, later became governor. But there's no question in my mind that New York City would have been a very different place in many ways in terms of its policies, and I think its law enforcement policies as well, if Ed Koch had not won that primary in, in that election. And Bill you know, stayed in office for, for th three, three terms until scandal drove him out and David Dinkins won. So that's, you know, I, I don't believe in the great man theory of history, but I, I do believe that certain things really are a turning point, and, and that was one of them. And I think it's an important point also that Graham has made about context and about you see pictures of looting, but you don't see the economic devastation that New York City had already suffered in the 1970s, the incredible flight of solid jobs from black communities and all communities. Um, the, you know, Ford to City, Drop Dead, whatever the headline was. Right. You know, no federal assistance and uh, really the hollowing out, the economic hollowing out of the city that it is not what you see when you see a photograph of looting, but it's very much part of what people were feeling and living through at that time. I, I don't, I, I'm also cognizant of what you said, Graham, about how some things really don't change, and the ability to play on fear in uh, criminal justice policy, immigration policy, or governance generally can never be underestimated. At the same time, things have changed. We don't lately get shot for our fur coats. Yeah. I don't have a fur coat, but if I did, I, um, you know, the crime is different. The crime is different, the crime is going down. At the Marshall Project, we spent a lot of time examining the question of why did crime go down? There is not consensus on that issue. There are many factors at play. But maybe we could spend a minute talking about why did New York City change? You've just heard this panel describe a New York that is not the New York that we live in today. What happened? How did it change? I think it's important for us to understand that if we want not to have it change back. Do any of you panelists want to take on the question of why New York City has changed since those times? Can we talk about it in terms of cops? Yeah, like we had a crucial question. When when Bill Bratton came to New York, um, he brought the broken windows theory, which has nothing to do with policing law. It's a sociological theory. It has nothing to do with policing law. Um, he revamped the Transit Police Department. As a matter of fact, the Transit Police Department was better run than the New York City Police Department. And I know because I've worked with both. The under Bratton was better. Under Bratton, <laughs> yeah. And in the process, we had specialized units. Crime was high in the subway. We had specialized units. I worked in one of those units. It was called the Black Hispanic Squad, and that's all it was, just blacks and Latinos. And we were sent into areas where the crime was high, from Harlem, the South Bronx, to Wall Street. And we dressed for the area that we were working in. We averaged 65 to 80 felony arrests every month with a conviction rate of 99.5%. Uh, I've done arrests across the street from the New York Stock Exchange where white people are selling cocaine in their Wall Street smarts. So the crime is there. It's in every neighborhood. And I worked just about in every neighborhood around the city. So it was, we were targeting felony crimes and crimes against people. There's no stop and frisk, none of that nonsense, no marijuana, none of that junk. Crimes against people. And that's how we brought it down. The one thing that we were trained to do that these young folks don't know how to do is to be patient and surveil an individual. You've heard of the Joint Terrorist Task Force and the work that they've done over the years. Well, many of the members of that unit were transit cops. Little did you know. We work in crowds. And we used to surveil people three and four hours. We followed guys from the Lower East Side to Midtown, to Harlem, 
up to Yankee Stadium, back down to Midtown before they took a victim. And we were there to, to make the arrest as the crime happened. And how did you pick those folks up? How did you know to? We, we watched body movements, eye movements of people. Um, we had also, they, they, they gave us photographs of guys who had ongoing arrest records in the subway. So you had to know these faces on site. But the problem in that is we had people who would ice pick a guy. If you were known to be a sex abuser, that's a guy that rubs up against a woman on the subway. And somebody, and I see you, I wait till you get on a crowded train, I can say, oh, he was rubbing up on a lady and arrested her. That's the problem with that. Just because I know the face. And I know police officers who were arrested for what we call ice picking somebody, taking them cold without having committed a crime. Two officers that were working in the command room when I was a detective went to prison for ice picking an individual. One was the niece of an inspector of NYPD. And she had been warned once before by the Manhattan DA's office. She went back out in plain clothes with her partner. Both of them went to prison for five years. Um, but we, we handled everything from police shootings to kidnappings and homicides. And all of the men in that unit went up in rank in the department. But we learned how to surveil people. There was no rush. Working in plain clothes, people thought I was the bad guy. I've had people walk up to sell me heroin. Prostitutes walk up, hey, you out for the night? Yeah, I'm already out of the street. Come on, get away from me. You know, but the, the thing is that there have always been quotas. This is another thing you need to know. There have always been quotas in police. But in those days, there was so much crime, you didn't have to worry about it. <coughs> there was more activity than you could handle. Moving forward, they talk about New York is now one of the safest, if not the safest city in the United States. So if crime has gone down, why were we doing stop and frisk? The interaction between the police officer and the civilian should only come when the police officer believes that a crime is about to occur or that a crime has been committed or he believes that a person is carrying a weapon. And that is the pack. If there's a pack, there's no weapon, there's no reason to go into the pockets. And these officers were violating, again, constitutional rights of blacks and Latinos. I'm sorry, were you taught that? That that was the rule? Yes. If you don't, if there is no weapon, you're making a stop. First of all, I believe there's a crime being committed, or you committed a crime, you fit the description. The description. I stop you, I question you, that's it. And how do you think it evolved from stop, question, frisk, and plunge into the pockets and show me what you got? Was they, that also taught? They gave these guys a quarter, go out and do five 250s, a week or whatever it is, so you now have to show that you're working. We all remember Mayberry with Andy Griffith. <laughs> all right? One bullet in the pocket. You remember Barney Fife. The uniform police officer's job is to deter crime. His job is not to get involved in anything if nothing is going on. So if nothing is going on, there is nothing that warrants me stopping you, asking you a question, or even patting you down. If you say that crime is down below where it was in 1962, then I shouldn't be stopping you and frisking you. And the only people that were being stopped and frisked were blacks and Latinos. They weren't doing it in Brooklyn Heights. They weren't doing it in Borough Park. They weren't doing it in Bay Ridge. So. If, if you think that I have a weapon, if I think you have a weapon, I pat you, there's no weapon, I have no reason to go into your pockets. Now this is called the fruit of the tainted tree because if you had no right going into the pocket, anything you retrieve is obtained illegally. The 14th Amendment guarantees us freedom from illegal search and seizure. The DA knows that. The judge knows that. Do they enforce it? No. Why is it that only blacks and Latinos are being stopped and frisked because their quote unquote is crime? I'll tell you why. 
it's part of a racist agenda. Young men like myself might want to work for the city of New York. White guys that live on Long Island, their uncles and fathers work in the city of New York. They want to get a job with the police department, with the fire department, with sanitation. So if the black guys that live here can't qualify for the job, it also guarantees the white boys from Long Island can come here and continue to get the job. Because you have been found to be in possession of marijuana and no one has entered into a class action lawsuit against these behavioral patterns of crooked cops. And it is racist. So a young man who is illegally searched, illegally arrested, now because it's marijuana, he cannot get a student loan to go to college. Did you know that? You can't get a student loan if you were arrested for any narcotic or drug possession. Did you know that? Anybody here, do you know that? Yes. All right, some of you do. But now everybody knows that. So now you have further looted another life because they can't go to school. They can't get financial aid. They can't get a job with the city because they've been arrested. And you wonder why. You have this. I think I've done maybe three or four stop and frisk in my life. One, the guy was carrying a loaded firearm. He was just released from federal prison after serving 12 years for bank robbery, and he went for the gun and tried to shoot me and my partner. Unfortunately, he didn't make it. Unfortunately for him. We didn't kill him. We knew how to do what we had to do with our hands but he had wished he had been shot. Stop and frisk. What do you mean by that? Derek and I have backgrounds in martial arts. So we knew. Did you him a beat? Oh, we beat him to the point where he stopped. He was trying to get the gun. He spun. He said, some explicatives I can't sit here. He spun towards Derek, went in for the gun. We knew where the gun was. His arm never made it to the gun. I snatched him up headlong into a wall and took him down on the ground. He was out, took the gun. All right. There was a train coming in. I remember it was Grand Street on the DI. He was done. It was quick. We don't do a one round, we do seconds. That's what we would do. Seconds. So you use the required amount of force needed to subdue the perpetrator. <laughs> Am I right? That's what they. That's the term they use. Necessary force. Can you tell that Tom's a reporter? He's trying to invoke the picture for you all. What actually happened on the D line? But no, we we took him, and uh, unfortunately, a judge let him out uh, for lunch, and the guy never came back. Uh, but stop and frisk. We used it very. Very rarely, and that, that morning they had given us instructions in roll call about revision to stop and frisk that very day. So I said, all right, we gotta do it by the numbers. We did the stop, we talked to the guy, we asked him a question, but he went from zero to 100. So we went from zero to 100. But the stop and frisk, demanding that they engage a person, and they have it on tape where the sergeant said, I want these guys off the stoops, I want them from in front of the buildings, go get them. Right. That was from the sergeant in the 81 precinct. That's one of the precincts. Even Edwin Raymond, who couldn't be here tonight, he has the case. Right. I think the policing is a central part of the story of what changed in New York. And we're not going to be, we don't have time to go yeah. through all of it. I want to make sure we have time for audience questions. There are a lot of other parts of the system at play here. Today, the Marshall Project has done a story about reformist DAs. Mm -hmm. uh, candidates for district attorney, in California there were a lot of them, who were running on a platform of locking up fewer people. This happens now in our country. Kim Fox in Chicago, Kim Hogg in Houston, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. These are people who are being elected prosecutor, not based on a tough law and order, I'm gonna lock them up and throw away the key, but actually the opposite. They're making the opposite case. The criminal justice system is too overbearing, we're gonna do less. I have to say our story is about how many of them lost in California. They didn't all win. But something is changing. How, how have we come to that? 
<coughs> Brooklyn has a pretty reform-oriented district yeah. attorney. It's yeah. a very well, you know, put, put stuff in context. Have you got the uh, stop and frisk slide up there that like shows that anybody written the cyclone recently? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's a remarkable thing you're looking at. The number at the top is almost 700,000. Right, almost 700,000 within two years, it was 22,000. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, right? So, I, when we try to figure out what changed, you know, one of the things that I believe doesn't get talked about in terms of like just changing the environment was what communities themselves did to both self-police, both in the worst time of the crack era when, you know, I think people decided that, you know, enough is enough and they tried to come up with ways in which to try to end crack dealers in their neighborhood, you know, not always using cops to come and, and rouse them, but to actually try to use, you know, you had uh, ministers and priests in the Bronx who were like leading marches in the streets to try to do things. People played a role in stopping crime that usually doesn't get talked much about. But as we did that, I mean, one of the amazing things that happened was that the politics of what was going on was that you wanted to have lower and lower crime stats every year. And we know from, if Edwin Raymond was here, he would talk about the quotas that he was forced to be able to, to forced to carry out in terms of the number of arrests, the number of stop and frisks that he had to do. And it wasn't until a combination of citizenry and uh, some great legal work by the Civil Liberties Union challenged it in the courts that you begin to see that collapse there. I mean, Bloomberg is still there. Bloomberg you know, was there for three terms. He comes in in 2001, there's almost 100,000. It climbs up to seven times that. Rick Kelly's the, the police commissioner. So how, how and why did that happen? And I think the answer is that they wanted to make sure that the numbers didn't get any higher. And the only way they could think of doing it was coming up with these pretextual reasons to stop people, which is this fancy word that just means it's an excuse to be able to stop maybe black and brown men and be able to, to rouse them. In, I don't know if we have this one, but in, in 1990, there were about 1,500 marijuana arrests in New York City. In, by, by 2000, right, this is still the Giuliani era, there were 50,000 marijuana arrests. And I, these were, I think, pretextual arrests that had nothing to do with actually preventing crime. They had to do with like trying to make sure that those numbers went as low as possible. One of the fascinating things about the, the stop and frisk numbers was that the number of shootings, like forget about the people they actually hit. Sometimes I used to think people were worse shots than ever before, and it's possibly true. But the number of shootings stayed level. All through that period where you're looking at that cyclone ride up to the top, the actual number of shootings is pretty flat throughout that. So the idea that Ray Kelly and the mayor kept telling us throughout that time was to get guns off the street well, number one, we know that they didn't find hardly any guns because the stats show that. But number two, it had no effect on the number of shootings that were happening. So, and in terms of this steady drop in, in numbers, you think one of the things that happened is they got better at saving lives, you know, in the trauma centers of the city's hospitals and all such things. So, you know, there were a whole lot of different factors that really had nothing to do with, like, this great policing. Uh, at the same time. If I may interject. Um, okay, I want to give Kim a chance to break in on this question yeah, too. But you don't 100 have... blacks in law enforcement. We were talking about this issue back in 2000. In 2000, 100 blacks in law enforcement were talking about this issue of stop and frisk. And the Attorney General of the State of New York, Elliot Spitzer, did a study in 2000. And you can go online and pull it up. He said that the process of stop and frisk Frisk as administered by NYPD was not correct at all. So you have a police commissioner who virtually told the attorney general, screw you, I'm going to do what I want to do. 
the fish stinketh from the head. The leadership was abhorrent. And it trickles down right to the police officers. When de Blasio ran, he ran talking about stop and frisk, bringing an end to stop and frisk. Bratton leaves. Jimmy O'Neill comes in, who's also a Brooklyn resident. And a transit police. And a transit cop. I knew him when he was a rookie. I remember when he became on a job. Nice guy. But he didn't like what he was seeing. So the leadership, when you vote for a mayor, you need to know who that mayor was thinking of in terms of a police commission, in terms of someone to run the Board of Education. And don't get caught up with their little campaign. You need to ask some serious questions. Who are you looking to bring in to help run the city? Because those commissions set the tenor of the police department. Uh, I want to make sure that you all in the audience are thinking about the fantastic questions that you're about to raise your hand and put to the panel. And Kim, if I, I can give say, you the last word yeah, on this issue. Just on the question of what is changing, I guess I would point to two things. I mean, I think first, um, in California, this is probably less the case in New York, actually, but in California, fiscal politics play a big role. It is actually, there's a way in which the kind of the two parts of the state are the kind of revolt against property, the revolt against taxes on the one hand and the, design, the kind of the, the push to incarcerate as a form of social policy, those come into conflict with each other eventually. California can't afford to maintain its prison population any longer and that is part of why the, there's been this shift. And I think that's happening elsewhere, but it goes along with, um, you know, I, I, just speaking within my little corner of American history, there's been a, a really profound change in how people talk about the prison system and its role in late 20th century American history. Or kind of seeing the more than two million people, the, 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 the radical growth of the number of people in prison and in jails as kind of one of the fundamental trends and facts of our society and of the late 20th century. And kind of asking how did this happen why did it happen? And kind of perceiving it as a, a human and moral disaster, um, and, and as you, you know, something that, that you know every uh, every stop and frisk represents a kind of disruption and transformation of the person's life, and a change in their relationship to the society and to the state, and and somehow, and I think you know, there's a lot of both the work of activists um, and intellectuals like Michelle Alexander, the author of the New Jim Crow and the work of a whole range of historians. Um, I would point to Heather Ann Thompson, uh, who wrote a book about Attica, and um, also Elizabeth Hinton. And there's a, there's a whole host, a kind of a whole generation of people who are working in this area. And I think this is happening in you know, many other fields too, which is the way, the particular, well, I've really seen the way people think and talk about this and think about it in relation in relation to the rest of the society really going through this shift and change and i think that's happening um you know in, in many fields and it's it's bringing about a, you know a, a, a sense of wanting to have a different um you know to, to change it so i hope that's true and i if i could just say on a personal note if any of y'all find yourself in montgomery alabama you be sure to visit the lynching memorial and the Civil Rights Museum that is newly established in Montgomery. And the reason is that it's different from every other Civil Rights Museum or exhibit you've ever seen. It's not about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and the Civil Rights Act, and people can vote, yay! It's about slavery becomes Jim Crow becomes mass incarceration. That is the Michelle Alexander thesis that Kim has just been talking about, and it's made very vivid in this museum, and it's the only civil rights museum I know of in our country that takes that story right up into the headlines of today. Very worthwhile. One of the things that makes criminal justice the kind of thing you can work on day after day is the fact that we can make progress on it. And you mentioned in California, fiscal conservatives have joined with liberals to say, you know, the prison population is actually too big. It's too expensive. <coughs> Also, don't forget on the right wing, a strong uh, religious voice for second chances, for mercy. This is an issue in America that it's possible to make progress on. 
So let's hear a few questions from the audience about how progress can be made. Hi there. I would love to hear a little bit about your perspectives on Sorry. Yes. Yes. Hi. I was hoping to hear about your perspectives on juvenile justice specifically. Uh, in New York, I know Governor Cuomo has had some uh, work done to look at the evolution of or the history of juvenile justice, but when we think about locking up people who are under the age of 18, what does that look like through your lens and where do we where are we and where do you see it going? Do you want to take that up? Well, I I have some I, I wrote down a note when I was on the subway, Khalif Browder, on my way here. Um, I do a public access show in Manhattan. I was running from there here today, and I wrote his name down on a sheet of paper. Because we've done a few shows with Khalif Browder. Um, and seeing what was done to this young man, not only to him, but to his family, to his mother, who had a heart condition prior to his arrest. The family unit, the breakup of the family, is a major factor. The incarceration, the mass incarceration of men pulling them out of the homes, just as these Women are losing their children coming across the border, and nobody knows where their children are. The breakup of the family, all of these factors are destroying generations of people. And you cannot continue to do this and think that everything is going to be hunky-dory. It's impossible. Our youth need guidance. They need direction. The Bible says that we are to love God to walk humbly with him and to show mercy. Children need guidance and they're not receiving the instruction or the help in these institutions set up as the way they are. ACS, I'm sorry if anybody works for ACS, I've had to deal with them terrible, terrible. But our, our, our youth need instruction. They need their parents. We have to get to young men and women with regard to parenting, teaching it, and being responsible for any sexual behavior one might have as well. I think one of the um, interesting things that we hear sometimes from advocates that we talk to at the Marshall Project is about raise the age, for example, in New York State, and you're right that progress has been made. What actually is the development of the human brain even after the age of 18? Are we appropriately, you know, we've struggled to raise the age to 18 in New York and a lot of other states. But in fact, developmentally, where are young men um, in terms of impulse control and, and, you know, the ability to find alternatives to violence? Um, I would also just recommend if you have time on Friday to listen to uh, This American Life. We've done a collaboration with them on incredible uh, school inside a jail in New Orleans. So it's not a GED program. It's an adult jail where they're housing juveniles because in Louisiana they love to prosecute juveniles as adults. And recognizing that fact, they've started actually a full-blown high school inside the jail. And what it's like to tell young men on the one hand, you're worthless and you're going to go to prison for 25 years because of this thing you did. And on the other, it's really important that you learn trigonometry. It's a very, very moving story. That's all I'll say. It takes, I'm the president of the Marshall Project. I read a lot of this stuff and it made me cry. So, I recommend this. this so, isn't bail, bond, isn't bail bond reform one of the ingredients to making some progress here? <coughs> what was the question? Bail bond Yeah. That was the issue with Brown. You know, it's, it's funny, you know, I, I did this story recently uh, for Marshall and for New York Magazine about the fact that uh, Manhattan, usually considered the most liberal borough with a district attorney there, had the highest number of people who were being sent to Rikers. The overall population of Rikers has dropped a lot. I mean, we should you know, be clear that like the numbers come down a lot. But this issue of bail, 
of like, which was the Khalif Browder initial problem was that he, his worst was in there because he couldn't post bail, has been one of these sort of stunning iniquities that's been sort of staring us in the face for decades and which has remained, I think, largely unaddressed. And now, I mean, we had an election here in Brooklyn where we had half a dozen candidates running for office, all of whom were basically trying to outdo each other as to how they were going to reduce the amount of people that they requested bail from. So, I mean, that's, that's an issue whose time has come, and it's interesting to watch the DAs drive the judiciary, and to, because the, I think the judges are behind what the, at least the district attorney here in Brooklyn is trying to do, and now the district attorneys in both the Bronx and Manhattan are trying to do one bail. Uh, the police are nowhere to be seen on the issue at this point. I mean, they're probably the most recalcitrant in terms of like, wanting people to stay in. But yeah, no, that's, that's an issue which I think is like kind of fine to stay. We have this window, low crime, we can have thoughts about reform, we can try to straighten things out. You know, we run the risk of like, Baltimore doesn't have that luxury right now. There you have a spike in crime, a serious crime rate going on. They're not able to have a successful conversation about what are the things we need to do to balance our criminal justice system in the same way we can have it here in New York. But we've got a chance now to make some of these changes and hopefully make them permanent. Bail's one of them. Actually, also recommend there's a very good recent book um, called A Lot of Time to Be Poor by Peter Edelman, which is, it has a good chapter on bail, but also kind of on, in the framework of the vast array of fines and that people can face in interactions with the criminal system. So, for example, um, I think in South Dakota, you actually have to pay your uh, pay for your public defender, um, or kind of a, just the host of. It just came up in Ferguson the vast array of fees that the local government <coughs> assesses. And so, in the, the book it, it, it has a very chapter on bail, but kind of as part of a larger um, problem. Yes, sir. Hi, I was hoping that uh, Tom could maybe expound on the particular influence of Ed Koch, and then maybe Kim could interrogate his opinion with uh, her knowledge of the rise of uh, financial influence in politics and the austerity politics that sort of came up around the same sort of time. Okay, there's a whole new panel we could spend the whole <laughs> If you could do I mean, that, my question quickly. was about expand on Ed Koch. You, you, said, you, said, you said that you felt that he had a Well, here's, here's one clear difference. I, mean, I don't know how it would have turned out, but Herman Badillo, during that Democratic primary, said that New York should default. You know, that was, you know, he said, we, instead of basically creating a system that Kim you know, delineates, and you know, this, this is the best book about the fiscal crisis that I've seen, and I've read them all, but like, she really walks you through that in a way that's really vivid and dramatic. And, and the, issue, the question of whether or not New York was going to default, basically, you know, the decision was made that everything had to be done to prevent the city from going, quote unquote, bankrupt. Other people argued the city already was bankrupt, and essentially what we're going to do by mortgaging so many of the social institutions here in the city, uh, by ending free tuition at CUNY, help me here, or just the laundry list. Hospitals, closing, closing different public health facilities, um, threatening to close libraries, Firehouses, a whole array of different, and not, not just reducing staffing, a whole set of cuts to the Board of Education, um, shortening the school day by 90 minutes, having him slash in the budget for school athletics, a whole array of different cuts. So, so was there another way to go, do you think? Uh, well, I, yeah. Like, would, would that have been the same without the that's a good question. I'm not saying there was at least one other candidate, and Badillo was seen as a formidable player at that time. You know, I mean, he was he was definitely the smartest guy in the race. There's no question about that. You know, uh, he 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 was, I think, so destroyed by the way he killed you know, in that race that he ended up turning into a caricature of himself eventually. But that's what he said. He says we are going to mortgage this city to the banks, and that happened. Um, my question is for Kim. This is Mike right there. Um, 
So on the one hand, the title of the, of the panel is The History of Politics and Neo-Criminal Justice. And so far, you've been focusing almost exclusively on matters that arose beginning the 1970s to the present, as if there's something really <coughs> extraordinary and unusual about that arc. And yet, you mentioned, Carol, earlier on, it would be good if folks went down to Montgomery and looked at the lynching from memorial. And the point of the memorial, and the point of the effort of DJI down there, is for people to actually confront their past, because unless you confront your past, you really can't deal with your present. And so I think back, by analogy, to New York City, and you go back 115 years to, to the Civil War uh, draft riots, where um, uh, black people, and almost two dozen black people, were actually lynched here in New York City. Um, and without any kind of, uh, uh, you know, retaliation, or without any kind of law and order. People were prosecuted. people were committed to engage in that kind of activity, basically with impunity. And the question is, can. okay, <laughs> if, uh, if she thinks that, uh, is there something special about the 70s and 80s, or is it part of a much larger continuum, more in line with what Carol was talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, so I, you know, I, I do think that there is something different about the 70s and 80s. Um, I think there is, it's not that it's apart from a longer continuum, and there is, um, you know, obviously in, in, for example, if you look at police violence, there's a whole, there's a spike in police violence in New York City after World War II, um, and there's, so there are, and, and, and this is the case in the, uh, in, in um, you know, the, the, the events that, Set off the um, the Harlem the kind of the uprising in Harlem in was it 64 65 um, but it was it was a, a you know another episode in which a a um, a poli uh, you know, off duty police officer killed a 15 year old boy so I, I you know, it is, there's a and there's a much there's a longer history here no question but I do think there is something that changes in the 70s and 80s and uh, I think there, it, it's, you know, there's a, a different, um, the, 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 I, I, in a way, I think it's important to look at the particular kinds of policies that produce a particular outcome, in this case, the kind of dramatic expansion of an incarcerated population, and the specific, um, you know, kind of both the laws that create that, the Rockefeller drug laws in New York, and the policing strategies that also produce it. I mean, it, so it's not just one thing, but I think it's a, a constellation of, it, it, it's, it's, and, and, and that, that is actually different than what came before. So it's not, and, and I think, yeah, I just think it's, it, while it's important to look at things in a, a large context and a longer history, it also matters to recognize what produces um, outcomes of inequality in different ways. Different eras. There's a certain point in American history where an unbelievable number of people go to prison. There are more than two million people in prison in the United States, and that was not always the case. So I think part of what we've been trying to do is examine yeah. that particular phenomenon, which you are so right, is not isolated from American history as a whole. <coughs> I think it actually also just with the high crime, that it's, it's, all, it's not the case of earlier moments of a spike in crime in American history, like the 1920s and 1930s, which also see a dramatic increase in crime. Um, and a certain kind of war on crime rhetoric in response to it, and the expansion of the FBI. But, but it's not, it actually doesn't lead to this incredible swell of a prison population. You know, I, I would just add one other thing in terms of what's different about it, was that I, I do believe that that was, in terms of New York City itself, it's where the question of like, who is this city for changed. And the, you know, as Kim lays out in, in her book, you know, the kind of ways in which we fashioned a city which would serve the people who worked here and who made it work, first and foremost, really changed in a dramatic way. So that those kinds of services that were being provided to people, everything from free, free higher education, you know, the latter was pulled up behind the white working class at that point with very little ways in which for the then growing black and brown population of New York. We, I used to use this number over and over again to just sort of try to figure out from 
we went from, at some point, a million industrial jobs in New York City in about 1960. That's a big number, a million. And by 1980, we were at a million, we lost that million industrial jobs and we had a million on welfare. Now, I'm not to say that like all of those things were happened because they had to happen, but it was really watching a city change as to the direction it was going to come. And you, you can talk about those kinds of jobs in terms of how to save it. The idea of like what the city should be, and I think this continues till today, is like the kind of city that it wants to be is still very much oriented away from those jobs which are reachable by those on the lower rungs of the ladder. And yeah. that's a change. Yes, I, I remember as a child growing up, my neighbors had the uh, tattoos from Buchenwald, Auschwitz and the prison camps, uh, the Nazi era. And uh, people were coming here and going to school at night to learn English. Mm. Schools were open at night. My mother worked for the board of mm. right? And I would go from school to school with her, picking up the payroll sheets and, and organizing stuff with her. We don't do that anymore. See, immigrants, you're supposed to. You're supposed to come here. You're supposed to be a scientist or a doctor or a professional. You're supposed to speak English when you get here. But for the Eastern Europeans, schools were open at night so they could learn the language and move up through the social strata. And as you said, the ladder was pulled up. Um, today, you see on the subway, if you want to learn to speak English, you got to go to some school somewhere and spend money to learn to speak English. Um, music programs. I, I was in the orchestral class in elementary school. I played the viol, I played the clarinet, I played drums. K kids don't have that anymore. Um, we have four schools in one building. That's insane. We have four principals in one building. It's mass confusion. Um, the New York City Police Department cost the city over a billion dollars in a 10 year period as a result of lawsuits. So that's a big chunk of change. It's a, yes, think about that. And years ago, all, right now, all the cop has to say is, "I was in fear for my safety, so I killed him." The state legislature wrote that into law. When I took that job, I didn't have a bulletproof vest. This is how we went to work every day, and it was more violent then than it is now. But now, all the cop has to say is, "I was in fear for my life." Rodney King. Go back and look at the video of Rodney King. What threat did he pose to those white cops in Los Angeles? See, by articulating certain things, and it's the subliminal message that's being sent, it makes it right. I have to interject that we have done a story at the Marshall Project about justifiable homicide, finding that uh, if the victim is black, the homicide is real justifiable eight times more often than if the victim is white. It's an extremely stark disparity. We've hit eight o'clock, which was the time that we said we were going to finish. There is afterwards a reception. I think you're invited to stay, to join us, to chat some more, to ask the panel questions that you didn't have time to ask tonight. We appreciate so much your interest in this issue and your patience with these complicated and difficult topics. Thanks for being here tonight, and thanks very much to the panel.